it's actually been quite a while since the last episode about this car, so let's jump back into this project with something exciting. Or, well, maybe I misused that last word. In this episode, we'll be talking about speedometer gears. The speedometer of this car has been working since I got it, although it's always been a little bit off one way or another based on which tires were on the car at the time. It does do the typical old mechanical speedometer thing where when you accelerate quickly the needle flutters real bad and doesn't give you a great reading, but other than that it works okay. So it works well enough that I didn't want to bother with it until the transmission started leaking ATF all over the floor. And not in the usual ways. Quite a while back, not too long after I had first bought this car, I had replaced the seal between the speedometer housing and the driven gear. The back of the transmission was dripping fluid, and after replacing this seal, that stopped. For a while. These pictures are from when I first removed it. And if you know a thing or two about these cars or these transmissions, you'll know that this is a BOP, aka Buick Oldsmobile Pontiac style speedometer housing for the Turbo 350 that we have here and some other transmissions like the Turbo 400. And if you know that much, you probably know that the bolt pattern of the bell housing of the BOP Turbo 350 is different and not directly compatible with the Chevy 350 small block. So, just from the part of the bell housing that you can see here, this is clearly a Chevy patterned Turbo 350 transmission. But it also has a BOP style tail shaft housing. This is most likely how the car would have been equipped from the factory since it came with a Chevy 305 small block. My understanding is that, even for this combination where they have to use a Chevy-style bell housing, they would still use the BOP-style tail shaft. So even though I don't believe that this is the original transmission for this car, it probably is how it would have been equipped. Either way, the speedometer cables are compatible between the two, and just from a visual examination we can see that the seal is leaking at the cable, and it's most likely the shaft seal that has failed again. So we'll have to disconnect that cable and remove the speedometer housing to get a better look at exactly what's going on. Really, this car has enough ground clearance that you could do this without lifting it off the ground, but it'll make things easier if we lift up the back and set it down on jack stands. And with that safely supported, we can roll underneath and remove the speedometer cable from the housing. We'll use a pair of channel locks to carefully unthread the collar. This connection shouldn't be too tight, and it may be possible just to loosen it by hand. We just used the channel locks to get it moving, and then unthreaded it by hand and pulled the cable out of the housing. And even more so than before we removed the cable, it was pretty obvious where our ATF was leaking out from. The next step in removing the housing is to remove this clamp hold down bolt. It's a small bolt, and it's threaded into aluminum, so we'll have to be careful with it. And once we have that loosened, we can remove the bolt and that hold down clamp. And now, the only thing holding in the housing is the friction from the o-ring seal around its perimeter. But despite not being held in by much, it didn't exactly drop free. We'll grab the housing with the channel locks and rotate, pull, and wrestle it loose. But don't put too much force on it or try to tweak it to the side. It should come straight out. And we did it! Despite the front of the transmission being tilted down, there will still be a little bit of fluid behind it, so be ready to catch that. And now we'll take the removed parts over to the workbench and take a look at them. Here we have the speedometer gear and the gear housing as removed from the vehicle. The outer o-ring seal is in good shape and considering how hard it was to remove, definitely seems like it's sealing correctly. This inner seal is the problem child. Let's take a closer look at these parts. This gear is a 35 tooth and is orange in color. It has faded and changed a little bit over the years, but that's what it's supposed to be. The teeth of the gear appear to be in good shape, but we can't quite say the same thing about the shaft. Those grooves out towards the end are not supposed to be there. The smaller, finer lines are from the gear wearing against the aluminum end of the housing. But there's also a softer groove just outside of them where the seal rides. And that is probably why we keep having these sealing issues. Although, taking a close look at the housing, there's also something else going on here. When I replaced the seal, I put it back in in the same orientation that the old one was in. But now I understand a little bit more about seals, and it really should be installed in the other direction. We should be seeing the flat side of the seal, not the open lip side. The lips should generally be pointed in the direction of the fluid they are sealing. In this case, it's this ATF. 
The seal's only a couple of years old, but we do have a replacement, and I'd like to correct that orientation mistake, so we'll go ahead and remove it. It's retained in the housing by a spring clip, which we will remove using a small flathead screwdriver. It's not really locked into a groove, it's just pressing outward against the housing to keep the seal from walking out. We'll grab a hold of one of the ends of the clip and lift it out of the housing, being careful not to bend it too much. And with that removed, all we have to do is lift out the seal. It's a soft, fully silicone seal, and we'll just use the flathead screwdriver to carefully lift it out. Just make sure not to touch the housing and scratch it up. We also took a good long look at the housing to see if it seemed worn, and it really does not. So I figure we'll replace that seal since we already have a new one, but it's probably the gear shaft itself that's the bigger issue. And if we're going to get a new gear, we might as well get one that complements our tire size choices. Selecting a gear can get a bit complicated, so I'll try to cover this in a relatively simple way and mostly just talk about this particular application. First up, we need to be clear that this BOP style TH350 housing and its gears are completely incompatible with the Chevy style parts. The BOP style gears are significantly larger. And the housings are not compatible with all of the driven gears. That's what these markings mean. These numbers are the driven speedometer gears that are compatible with the housing. It should be noted that it's not a complete list, but it gives you a general idea of whether it's compatible with the lower or higher tooth count gears. For example, ours had a 35 tooth gear on it, and the lowest one listed on the housing is a 36. In a minute here, we're going to start doing some calculations, but before we start throwing those numbers around, we need to figure out all of our variables, one of which is the tire size. As far as the original tire size, it was a little hard to figure out. The label in the door jam is very faded and difficult to read. And I had to dig around on the internet for a while before I found some good vintage reference material with the numbers I was looking for. And after cross-referencing that stuff, I can say with a relatively high degree of certainty that the tires that came on this car from the factory would have been FR78 by 15s. This is an obsolete tire size, though there are modern equivalents. The F78 alphanumeric indicates the series and size of the tire, the R indicates radial construction, and the 15 indicates the wheel diameter. The exact modern equivalent to this is a little bit fuzzy, but it's probably something like a 205 75 15. There are some very easy to use calculator tools online to help with this, but for the sake of the video we'll do the math on screen. And there you go, here's the calculation done for an FR7815 tire. We know we have a yellow drive gear, which should be an 18 tooth. And the calculation tells us that with that drive gear, it would most likely be looking for a 32 tooth driven gear. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist, so it probably would have had a white 19 tooth gear and a 34 tooth driven gear. Since a lot of these aren't the original parts, I don't know for sure what it would have come with from the factory, but we can make an educated guess. But that's for an approximation of the stock tire size, how about the tires that are actually on there right now? The back tires are Mastercraft Avenger GT 275-60-15s. And quickly, we'll walk through the calculation for getting an approximate revolution per mile out of that measurement. We'll start with the P-metric information. The section width is 275 millimeters, and the height is 60% of that. So the tire should be around 165 millimeters tall on each side of the wheel. And that converts to around 6.5 inches. And if we multiply that by 2, we'll have approximately the total height of the sidewall of the tire. And we add in the wheel diameter for the total diameter of the wheel-tire combination. Then we can calculate the circumference using 2 pi r to get our circumference of 88 inches. And to calculate the number of revolutions per mile of the tire, we would take the number of inches in a mile, which is 63,360, and divide it by our tire circumference. And that comes out to about 720 revolutions per mile. The thing is, this is just an estimation. Most tire manufacturers will report their version of these numbers, and the one for this particular tire is 739 revolutions per mile. And that number is likely to be more accurate than our estimate, so we'll go ahead and use that for the next calculation. And for this equation, we'll punch in the number of teeth of the drive gear, the axle ratio, and the revolutions per mile of the tire, and divide that whole thing by 1001. 
That 1001 comes from how many revolutions it takes to read one mile on a GM speedometer. In the past I've heard a thousand, but when I was looking up these equations I found the site saying 1001, so we'll go with that. It'll be pretty darn close anyway. And back to the numbers. If we punch everything in using our 18 tooth yellow drive gear, that means we should have a driven gear around 32 teeth. And just like we talked about with the stock tire size, that gear does not exist. 34 is the lowest driven gear tooth count. So while I would like the speedometer to be accurate, I don't need it to be badly enough to remove the tail shaft from the transmission and get a new gear for it. The gear is retained by a clip and is relatively simple to remove once the tail shaft housing is out of the way. In a video for our 91 Firebird, we removed its tail shaft housing and the process is very similar. But if we were looking to replace the gear, it would be a white gear, because when we punch 19 teeth into that same equation, it's pretty much exactly 34. Ideally, I would think you would want the reading to be a little high rather than a little low, because that would help you stay out of trouble with speed cameras and such. But with our tire, transmission, and axle ratio combination, it doesn't really seem like that's possible. We need the drive gear with the most teeth and the driven gear with the least, but since we're not currently changing the drive gear, we'll just get the driven gear with the fewest number of teeth. That will get us as close as we can. Our old orange gear was a 35 tooth, and this light green gear is the smallest they make, a 34. So without changing the drive gear, the speedometer won't be quite right, but at least this gear change is pushing it a little bit in the right direction. Going by our calculations, the speedometer will read about 5.5% slow, meaning the odometer will be reading low, although it also was before, and we'll have to keep all of this in mind. Also, simply replacing that worn out old gear with a new one should give us a smooth sealing surface and at least fewer oil leaks. And in our particular case, it's also nice to be replacing the gear since some somebody let it roll off the table onto the floor and it kind of snapped in half. Obviously the plastic had become pretty brittle over time, so that's another reason why it's a good idea to replace an old one. But let's not focus on who let what roll off the table, because we've got a new seal to install in our housing, and hopefully that will stop the actual issue that we set about to address, which was the oil leak. The speedometer housing, also called the sleeve I've seen in some places, appears to be in good shape, as was its o-ring which was sealing properly. But since we have a replacement o-ring we might as well install a new one. So we'll go ahead and remove the old seal. We'll use an o-ring pick to get underneath and carefully remove that o-ring. We'll make sure the new o-ring matches the old one and then soak it in ATF to get it ready to install. Before installing it though, we'll use some red Scotch-Brite to try to clean up the housing as best we can. This will help give everything a smooth surface finish and hopefully keep it from marring up our new speedometer gear. Once we've shoved a piece all the way through the housing, we'll show you a pro tip or maybe a stupid tip, but either way, we'll go ahead and chuck that piece of Scotch-Brite into the drill. Then we can, well, spin the whole thing and kind of give a light honing to the inside of that housing. And once the inner diameter is super smooth, we'll try to deburr the edge, which is what seems to have left those deep grooves in the old speedometer gear. We don't want to mess up the sealing surface, but that sharp corner at the edge of the seal is what we're trying to remove. A small piece of sandpaper and a Phillips screwdriver seem to clean up the end of that passage pretty well. Then we'll spray the whole thing off with brake clean and make sure there are no abrasives left on any surface. And we'll take our new, oiled housing o-ring seal and slide it into its groove. And with that in place, we'll oil our new speedometer gear to housing seal and install it into the housing. Since the whole thing is a soft silicone, we don't need a seal driver or anything, we can just push it down into place. And once it's fully installed, we'll slide back in the spring clip and push it all the way back as well. That spring clip should be fully up against the seal all the way around. And now we can slide in our new gear to make sure everything fits. And it seems like we're in business, so we'll roll back underneath the car. Before installing the housing, I just did a little test just to make completely sure that the gear was going to mesh correctly with the drive gear and the transmission. Everything checks out, so we'll go ahead and oil the gear, slide it back into the speedometer housing, and get that into place. 
We'll pop the housing back into the tail shaft of the transmission, but just like when it came out, it is a tight fit and requires a bit of effort. Using the channel locks to push in while gently turning the whole thing gets it into place fairly easily. Then we can reinstall the hold down clamp and the hold down bolt. The tabs on the housing need to be aligned correctly with this hold down clamp before we tighten down the bolt. And once everything is lined up, we'll go ahead and tighten down that clamp bolt to six foot pounds. Then we can reinstall the speedometer cable. Make sure the drive flat is lined up with the speedometer gear and it should install very easily. Then we'll get the collar tightened down finger tight and give it just a little bit extra with the channel locks. This does not need to be crazy tight and you will definitely break something if you try to get it that way. So show at least a little bit of restraint. And there you go, everything is finished. But with it still in the air while the transmission was in neutral, we grabbed the drive shaft and turned it a few times to make sure there wasn't any binding. Then with the back wheels still off the ground, we started the car up. We put the transmission into drive and let everything spin a little bit to make sure the speedometer was working correctly. The speedometer was working, the tires were spinning, and no plastic gears had yet exploded, so it seemed like we were in good shape. It is an open differential, but both tires were spinning with the back end off the ground. Theoretically, that means the drag between the two sides is very similar, which is a good sign for the drivetrain. After this off-the-ground test, of course, we set it back down and got back to driving the car. Honestly, I didn't really notice a difference in the speedometer readings. It kind of felt about the same, and it was a relatively small change, so I guess that's not surprising. But the difference that I did notice is that there was no longer any oil dripping out of the back of the transmission. We checked back in on it a few days later, then a few months later, and the transmission still hadn't started leaking. And as of uploading this video, it has been over a year, and the speedometer housing is still sealed up tight. So I think we did solve that problem. Was it a small problem that we overcomplicated and overthought? Y yeah, yeah probably, but we did fix it, and we moved slightly in the right direction as far as speedometer accuracy.